Good morning, Professor Molina. How are you doing today? Pretty well, thank you, Kiara, and thank you for having me, and thank you for taking your time to help. Yes, sir, no problem. Can you tell us a little bit about your academic background? Yes, uh, I guess I'll begin really where I started, in the streets of Brooklyn, New York, where I was born and raised. And fortunately, I was sent to a good prep school. Uh, why? Because a woman named Mrs. Frances Walsh paid my tuition for four years. I had never met her before. So, and fortunately, it was a very good quality prep school. Uh, in a sense, we were tr pretty well educated in what we call the liberal arts. And on finishing school, I opted to major in physical education. Why? I have no idea, but I would suspect it was my baseball coach, who was really a nice man, but unfortunately died in a truck accident before my senior year. And he was a physical education teacher and coach. And from that, I went to Manhattan College in New York City, and I began my studies of physical education. Manhattan College is a small Catholic college in the city, and physical education program was in the College of Liberal Arts. So we had all sorts of requirements other than teacher preparation. And my initial objective was to be a teacher in New York City. So that's why I began. And part of, I'll finish that, and part of that, during my undergraduate years, I had the good fortune of working on play streets. Play streets are a New York phenomenon. There are regular city streets shut off the traffic from 8 in the morning to 8 at night. And in the summertime, the police athletic league ran recreation programs. And I worked those for three summers. And it's probably right then and there where I learned of my interest in working with children, specifically teaching children skills and things like that. So that's really how I got started. How did you decide what university to attend to? For graduate school. <laughs> yes, well, when I was finishing my undergraduate degree, I had good grades. Uh, on a four-point scale, I was very close to the top. I think 3.8, something or other. So I had no trouble with grades. And my teacher recommended I go to work on a master's degree. And I applied to Ball State University, uh, Notre Dame University, and University of Wisconsin. And Wisconsin offered me a fellowship. A fellowship means you don't work for anybody, you just go to school. I had at the University of Wisconsin a NAP fellowship. And I think I probably was the first physical education major ever to receive one of those. So I opted to go to University of Wisconsin, which was a very, for, very fortunate and fortuitous choice because there I met the man who would eventually be my major professor, Dr. Lawrence Rarick. And he is the one who uh, got me started. And I began a program in Madison, and I worked on a master's degree under his supervision. Then I continued on. What do you recall as your first exposure? The first exposure to research was probably with Dr. Rarick uh, in my master's program. And the first thing he asked me to do was to reanalyze somebody else's data. He said to make sure it was correct. And that got me started. And then I eventually began my, my project, my master's project, uh, which was on ankle injuries. Uh, why? He was interested in the issue. And so since I did not have to work for anybody, within two semesters, my master's degree was completed, including writing my thesis. I was home in the summer of 1960, working on a play streets already. And, but at the end of my master's thesis, uh, they were just beginning a doctoral program at the University of Wisconsin, where I was. And Dr. Eric and Dr. Larson invited me to the PhD program. And so I continued on. Can you tell us a little bit about your doctoral dissertation? Oh, my doctoral dissertation was fun. Uh, I was a baseball pitcher. And uh, obviously pitchers depend on control, which means speed and accuracy. And at that time, in the field of motor learning, we called it, how children learn skills, uh, the, one of the topics of interest was knowledge of results. What, what that means is people know what you're talking about. How does this affect their performance? And I got intrigued by that. And they called it information feedback in those days. So with Dr. Eric, I developed my doctoral thesis on speed and accuracy of throwing. And uh, what did I ask? What happens if I remove feedback? For example, we, with Dr. Eric, we built a device that as soon as the boy released the ball, the lights blacked out the target. So I had no idea where the ball went. And we were able to record where it landed. So I had several groups of boys. One, we took speed only, accuracy only, both speed and accuracy feedback, and then boys with no feedback just threw the ball. And then a control group. And I had very good uh, 
set up in a, in a boarding school, one like I went to, uh, where we had control of the freshman class, and that was my experiment, which led to my doctoral thesis on the effects of feedback on speed and accuracy of throwing. A baseball, that is. Okay, Professor, what sort of research did you have um, early, and did you change your research at any time? Good question, and it's true, I did change. Uh, when I was doing my studies in physical education with Dr. Rarick, uh, I was exposed to really the world of children and how they learn skills, how they develop skills. And, and also in the context of this, Dr. Rarick always reinforced the importance of how children grow and mature. And we used all the old literature which was available, most of the University of California, Berkeley. And in, in doing so, I developed interest in the physical growth and maturation of children and how does it affect their motor development or movement development and their physical skills. And when I finished my doctoral thesis, I wanted to, f to initially do a postdoc meaning I'll do some special research to learn more about the growth and maturation of children. But uh, Dr. Eric put me in contact with a, a Professor Wilton Krogman at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Uh, Dr. Krogman was a physical anthropologist who ran a, a clinic called the Philadelphia Center for Research in Child Growth, affiliate of the University of Pennsylvania. And Dr. Krogman flew me in for a visit and I spent two days talking to him and colleagues about my interest in learning more about growth of children. And during the course of the two days, Dr. Krogman asked me, I would, told me I would suggest you go for another PhD. I was 26 at the time. And like a good Brooklyn boy, I said, why? He says, you are talented, you're capable, but your doctor's in physical education, nobody will believe you. Very, that's the perceptions of physical education. I said, okay. So I had guaranteed research money for the next four years. All my tuition paid, my books bought, and so on. And I began studying physical anthropology, which was a completely new field of study uh, for me. And a very, I will never regret the decision because it opened my eyes to the world. And what did I mean by that? I learned physical growth and maturation of children that taken for granted. But it exposed me to the world of human variability. This is what anthropologists look at. How do people in this part of the world compare to those in that part of the world and so on? And it really, it, you talk about an eye open. I was stunned. I was studying about skeletons and fossil man, and genetics was just beginning at the time. And it was fun for me. I had a great time. Uh, and then uh, the other thing I learned, it exposed me to the, to the concept of culture, that people in different cultures differ. They have different ideas of the world, and that affected my entire career because from that day on, I pretty well had a biocultural view of the world. In other words, biology and behavior interact. Biology and culture interact. For example, uh, you eat food. What you call food is defined by your culture, but it's going to affect your biology. Or think about children, you know, how we raise children, how children move. It's important in different cultures. And that was a major eye-opener. It really, it, it basically changed my career completely. But I ended up working with Dr. Krogman. I did my doctoral thesis on the growth of Philadelphia black and white children, uh, looking at their growth, their biological maturation, and movement, how they learn skills. So I had a great time in downtown Philadelphia on the streets with the kids, but that's where I'm very much at home. And so I finished my doctoral thesis at Philadelphia at University of Pennsylvania in 1967, and uh, I was awarded in 1968, and my career began initially in anthropology. And in 1967, I accepted a, a teaching position at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and it was interesting because I never looked for a job. Uh, at that time, jobs were available. And um, one of my professors said, uh, he received a call from UT, from one of his colleagues, said, do you have anybody finish a degree in physical anthropology? So I applied for the job and I got it. And began my career at UT in teaching. What are the basic or underlying issues behind your research? Now, the basic issues under my research is kind of fun. Uh, the, the central theme is the growth and maturation of children. And from there, you could take any number of different perspectives. Uh, 
how does it influence their motor development or movement development and skills? Uh, this is one thing I did from the beginning almost. Uh, and even my teaching, when I got to the University of Texas, I taught introductory physical anthropology. I had to teach about skeletons. But then I put in my own courses. I put in my own course on growth of children in anthropology. Eventually, a course on motor development of children in anthropology. And after about four or five years, I put in a course on youth sports in anthropology. People were freaking out, saying, what is this crazy guy teaching? But I, I pretty was able to do what I wanted to do. And it forced me, or gave me the opportunity, because anthropology is very, very flexible, to pursue issues I wanted to pursue. I continued my studies of growth of children, uh, beginning with my students. We began studying Mexican-American children in Texas. I had a student from Brownsville, so we were down in Brownsville working with the youngsters. Uh, and then, after my first year at Texas, over a beer, one of my friends said, would you like to come to Mexico and work with me? He was a cultural anthropologist who, who just finished his thesis two years before I, working with uh, indigenous people in the south of Mexico, a place called Oaxaca. And so uh, that summer, or that May, I had some research money, and I went down to Oaxaca, Mexico, first time in my life ever, and I studied the growth and maturation of Zapotec Indian children in a rural community. That began in the summer of 68. And that project, by the way, still goes on. We worked in a community uh, again in 1978. We worked in a community again in the year 2000. And right now, with two former students who work with me in Oaxaca, we're still trying to get back for another vi visit to the village. So that is a complete career changer. But uh, we studied growth, maturation, nutrition. Uh, how they raised their children. I did the performance of the Indian children. Uh, continued, and we've got some youngsters I saw in 68. I saw them again as young adults in 78, and I saw a number of them in 2000. So it's kind of a fun project, but it gives me a very different view of the world. And so that's a part of my life that most people don't know about, that I really enjoy working in Mexico, and I've done it, and I've had a good time doing it. So that's another research track that I pursued. And then while at Texas, I became friends with colleagues in physical education, obviously. We had a lot in common. And they asked me if I wanted to work with the athletes. And I began studying athletes at, in Texas, uh, beginning with um, youth swimmers. They had a big youth swimming program. And I eventually began working with all of the women athletes at the University of Texas. I worked with them for 10 years, from 1985 to 1995. So you look at growth of children, young athletes. My students got interested in high school athletes. We were mostly interested in, in female athletes. Why? Title IX started, so we need to tell more about the young girls in sport. And that continues. And I still work with the athletes to this day. So to answer this question in three ways, the three parts really, <coughs> growth and maturation continued. I began working in Mexico, which gave me a completely new directive, and I spent a, a good part of my life working with athletes, both youth athletes in addition to collegiate athletes. And then, of course, uh, I married and so on, and I ended up coaching my own children in the sport, which gave me a very different perspective than most researchers. I not only study them, I not only played sport, plus I coached my own children in the sport. So I got a very different perspective of the world. Can you tell us about a research project that you were interested in? A research project I'm interested in? Oh, many. As, you, as I just said, there are many, many projects I'm interested in. And uh, I'm not sure. I would say which is my favorite. I would still go with, this, uh, with the three of them that I already summarized briefly. The growth and maturation per se, which I still do. Uh, working in Mexico, hopefully we get our funding to go back again. Because right now, the issue you need to pursue is in rural Mexico, uh, in many of these rural communities, you're seeing a, uh, many people are dying from diabetes, right. which is very common in Mexican-American population. And then I'm still working with athletes in um, Portugal and in England. Uh, I have two former students with whom I collaborate. And uh, we're still working on a growth and maturation of athletes, mostly in soccer. So that's a, a, the issue. And then since retiring, I officially retired from university life in 2002, I've been doing a lot of work with colleagues in Poland uh, on growth of children. I've worked with people there. 
And uh, that project is still going on. It's a methodological project that uh, is not making very many people happy. But uh, so I have enough to keep me busy. Can you tell us about your involvement with NASPA? NASPA is the, uh, always been part of me. I was part of it in the beginning uh, because there weren't that many of us who studied the growth and maturation of children and motor development. Uh, a unique feature of my background was because of Dr. Rarick who introduced me to the motor development of children. And uh, he, he, taught, he taught a course, actually physical education 184, I'll never forget it, motor development. And that is the course that turned me on to studying how children learn movement skills. And uh, Dr. Rarick placed it in, a, in the context that motor development is important, but children grow up. And that's where we get to the growth and maturation. And at that time, I probably was one of the few in the field who tried to integrate growth and motor performance. As, as an aside, I was at a conference about two months ago, and a number of people spoke before me. They also went to Wisconsin after me, and they were talking about their education and motor development. But what they never mentioned was the growth of children. And that really kind of hit me between the eyes, more or less, because when Dr. Rarick left Wisconsin in the maybe late 60s, growth and development disappeared from the program. People learn motor development, but they were missing the biological growth and maturation of children. And I attribute that to Dr. Eric. And so that was my background. And in the early days of NASPA, uh, I gave several papers on motor development and specifically factors which affect it, cultural factors. How do children develop in Mexico and Guatemala and Africa? Or why are African children tend to be a little bit quicker in movement skills than American children? and so on. So I'm, I was interested in the whole idea of how does motor development vary among populations. So I've written several papers on that and I began pursuing it. And that's my, that was the beginning of my association with NASPA. And of course, as we get specialized, we deviate a little bit, but, and I kind of deviated too, perfectly normal. And, uh, but still, still, a few of my students especially recent students, are very active in NASPA. And that's probably where I get most of my connections right now. And there is a, seems to be a reinvigoration of interest in the movement development of children. It's still a relatively small group, but um, who are taking it seriously. Many talk about it, but they have no clue what they're talking about. And you've got a new group now who I believe are very seriously interested in looking at movement development, uh, internationally, cross-culturally, and I'm happy ha to have had a small part in probably help stimulate some of that. What does being named a distinguished scholar of NASPA mean to you? Ooh. Being named a distinguished scholar by any, anybody is uh, very self-satisfying and in part flattering. Uh, but in NASPA, it's, it's very, very special because I was among the early ones who be belong to the group starting way back when and it is recognition for your contributions to the field and it's nice to be recognized by your own peers and uh, it's something some people take lightly I take very seriously uh, because most people don't realize how hard we work and it's nice to be recognized for the contributions of yourself and really of your students. And by being named a distinguished scholar, it's nice for me, but it also is recognition of the many students I had the good fortune of working with and the many children I had the good fortune to study. So in many, many ways, uh, this made life a lot easier for me because without your graduate students, most professors would do nothing unless you sit in the library all day and work. And uh, during my career, I've had the good fortune to work with many masters and doctoral students, and they are really a part of my life that I can never uh, forget because they help make my career, and hopefully I help make their career. Professor, are there any other thoughts you would like to share? Oh, I could always go on and talk about sharing. Yes, uh, I would thoughts to, to begin with. I would thank my graduate students uh, because 
I always considered my graduate students peers, uh, and I always preferred working with my students one-on-one. -on -one. And every one of them pursued a different project, which helped me to broaden my horizons. So that made life a lot easier. And I've turned out a few students who I'm incredibly, I'm proud of all of them, but some of them have done quite well in their careers. Uh, and uh, they deserve some special mention. Uh, Claude Bouchard, who's at uh, LSU, uh, Claude basically has turned uh, the genetics of physical performance into a major field of study. Um, John Himes, worked, my first PhD student, was professor of public health at the University of Minnesota, uh, and so on. Very few of my students, by the way, went to an anthropology program. They went to sports science, to, to public health, and so on. And, and right now, uh, the two students I work with most often, uh, one's in England, a former student who's working with the, Brit the British Premier Soccer League, the English Soccer League, on youngsters in, in their system, and my colleagues in Portugal. And I just learned from a student, uh, a former student, who's at, finishing up at Michigan State right now, he will become the head of the USA football program for the youngsters, uh, which is nice to see uh, people with whom I worked, with whom I had a small part in ed educating them, uh, do well. And then there are two others that I need to mention, uh, Bert Little and Maria Pena, both work with me in Oaxaca, and both of them are taking the lead on hopefully a follow-up study of our people in Oaxaca. So to me, uh, the word I give to, to people, uh, take your students seriously, enjoy working with them, and hope for the best. And I've been very fortunate. I've had good fortune with my students, and um, they made my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Kiara.